This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everyone. Probably. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about why did Jesus die and why is it relevant to me or to you? Um, so I was asked this by a friend a little while ago, um, and I think it's a pretty big question. Um, kind of came out of the blue, I think, and I was just like, well, why am I a Christian if I don't know why Jesus died? Um, I think I do, but um, I wasn't able to articulate it very well. Um, so obviously the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus is a pretty big part of the biblical narrative. Um, so I thought this week would I'd like to look into that question and kind of meditate on that. It's always nice to go back to the basics sometimes. Um, so our brother John really emphasizes Jesus' life as a central point of our faith. John says in chapter 14, verse 6, um, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And then same in John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then same in John 3, verse 36. Whosoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whosoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. So, as we can see, a pretty big part of um, our faith is Jesus' life. Uh, and we come every week um, here and we partake of this bread and this wine um, and we proclaim Jesus' death or at least that's what we're told to do in Corinthians, where it says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So what is so important about um, Jesus' death? Um, we know it's significant, but sometimes I feel like I don't really understand how or why Jesus' death is so important to me. We live, or he lived 2,000 years ago, um, and he died halfway across the world. Seems pretty distant. Um, and, you know, I think most of us like to think that we live godly lives, or we try to. Uh, to try and to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, to love your neighbor as yourself. And Samuel says in First Samuel, um, verse 15, but to obey is to, First Samuel 15, chapter, sorry, First Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. So to obey is better than sacrifice why do we need Jesus' sacrifice? It's not even like it's my sacrifice. I didn't really do anything. Jesus kind of died 2,000 years ago, and, and, and now somehow it's a part of my life. In the Old Testament, um, sacrificing an animal had some weight to it um, because a lamb or an animal back then was valuable, and you had to raise it, and you had to feed it, and you had to look after it. And then after doing all this work to look after this one lamb, you would say, you would um, say that I value my connection with God so much that I'm willing to give up something so precious to me, and it's this way of showing um, that your spiritual relationship with God was more important than the earthly possessions you had. Jesus' sacrifice stands in stark contrast to the idea of a personal connection, or at least it can feel like that. Unlike the old uh, style sacrifices involving hard work. And a sense of possession, Jesus' sacrifice for many can feel like a distant and dis, uh, can feel distant and disconnected. His life and his actions, which occurred 2,000 years ago, can seem remote, lacking a direct relevance to our lives today. So, to understand Jesus' death, 
uh, and his resurrection, we have to understand a few different things. Uh, first is the purpose of God for the earth or for us. Then uh, the second is the impact of sin. And the third is the work that Christ actually did. And then how are we connected to this redeeming work of Christ? And finally, what does that mean for us in our daily lives? So, God's purpose for the earth. Um, I think most of us know that pretty well. It is rooted in his deep love and desire for creation to flourish in his divine presence. The Bible illuminates his purpose in Genesis 1 verse 28, when God blesses humanity saying, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. It's clear to see that God wants us to multiply um, and fill the earth, um, that we might reflect through a harmonious existence with the earth um, and the living beings within it, the glory of God. And in Habakkuk 2, verse 14, it says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, as the waters cover the sea. So God's plan is to fill the earth with uh, his glory. So how does that get impacted by sin? Sin poses a significant obstacle in the fulfillment of God's purpose. As the Bible states in Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Sin disrupts the purpose by creating a separation between humanity and God. It introduces brokenness, discord, and suffering into the world, hindering the flourishing of God's intended harmony. Instead of reflecting on God's glory, sin distorts our relationship with him and with one another. If sin is missing the mark, and we all sin, then we all take away from God's glory. And there's the consequence of sin, which we know the wages of sin is death. And in Isaiah it says, But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. In Ezekiel 18 we read, The one who sins is the one who will die. Concept that a sinful nature entered through one man, um, entered the world through one man, and that all of humanity has a tendency to be sin. Tendency to sin is a fundamental belief that we read um, or we know of through the narrative of the Bible. Its idea is rooted in the biblical account of Adam and his disobedience in the Garden of Eden. Sin entered the world through Adam, and it's written in Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, this verse kind of tells us that, affirms that sin originated in the world through Adam's disobedience, um, when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, they introduced sin into the human experience. We know that sin is universal, because uh, in Romans it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we know that everyone throughout history, apart from Christ, um, has fallen short and takes away glory from God because of our sinful nature. We know that we're born with this um, innate tendency to sin because in Psalm 51, David tells us, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So it's just built into our nature that we are sinful or we have this tendency to be sinful. And so what we have is the Bible teaching us that Sin entered through Adam's disobedience, resulting in a universal inclination for all of us towards sin. The inherent tendency is to sin is why people fall short of the glory of God and need redemption. So now we know that God wants to fill the earth with his glory, but because of our sin, we fall short of that glory, and the consequence of that sin is we die. However, we also know that God loves us, loves us so much that he gave us his only begotten son 
And in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God clearly has a plan that we can come to repentance and be reconciled from the sin. So how does God plan to achieve this? Well, that's through the work of Christ Jesus. So let's just go over a brief overview of who Christ was. Christ was just like us. He had a sinful nature. And we read that in Hebrews where it says, for this reason, he, Jesus, had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He's able to help those who are being tempted. So we know that Christ was a human and was tempted in all points like we are. But we know that Christ did it unlike us without sinning. In 1 Peter verse 2 verse 22 it says, He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. And this just reiterates that though Christ had our sinful nature, he was able to overcome and be sinless. We read that Jesus was fully committed to God's will. Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Throughout his life, all Jesus did was commit himself fully to fulfilling God's plan and to living in obedience to his father. So, being perfect and not deserving death, Jesus still dies on the cross. Why is that? Well, there's two main reasons I want to highlight today, and that's one is that Jesus had to put to death his sinful flesh. As we know, he was born with the sinful tendency like we are, and so to overcome that, he had to put to death the flesh and his sinful nature. And in Romans 8 verse 3, you read, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. This verse signifies that through his sacrificial death, Jesus condemned sin in the realm of flesh, providing a means for believers to overcome the power of sinful nature. And the other point that is important for why Jesus died is his life and death are a reflection of his devotion to living in obedience to God. Jesus says, by myself I can do nothing. I judge, I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but to him who sent me. Throughout his earthly life, Jesus consistently sought to fulfill God's will rather than his own. So, Jesus is sinless, and he dies as devotion to God's will, and to put to death his sinful flesh. And what does he achieve by doing that? Well, we know that Jesus' death couldn't be permanent since he had not sinned. And because he had lived a perfect, sinless life, death could not have a permanent hold on him. Acts 20 Acts 2 verse 24 illustrates the concept that but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So because Jesus was sinless throughout his life and dedicated to the Lord and gave his life for it, his resurrection from the dead is a testament to his victory over sin and his victory over sin and death and offering the promise of eternal life to those who believe in him. And so through his death, he was able to do away with death. But 
Also, God had a plan that through his death that he would become as the role of a high priest. In the Old Testament, the high priest played a crucial role in meditating and mediating between God and humanity, offering sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. The book of Hebrews uh, in the New Testament explains how Jesus fills this role of a high priest in a unique way. In chapter 4, from verse 14 to 16, uh, it reads, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Through his sacrificial death on the cross, Jesus became the ultimate high priest, offering himself as the perfect and eternal sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. His role as high priest allows believers to approach God's throne with confidence, knowing that through faith in Jesus, they can receive God's mercy and grace. So Jesus died and was able to fill this role, but how is that connected to us? Well, Christ represents us in our sinfulness. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. And so Christ represents us facing the temptations like we did in the weakness of human flesh, but he remained sinless. So through faith, uh, we read in Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 8, For it is by grace that ye have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Faith is the key to our connection with, a, with Christ's redemption, as it is through faith that we receive the gift of salvation. And lastly, um, but most importantly, how we, how the redeeming work of Christ relates to us is that we have to identify with him. He didn't die instead of us, he died with us, or at least that's our role, to die as, to follow, to pick up our cross and follow him. In our walk to the kingdom, we must believe in God, the Father, and Christ, the Son, to be and then to be baptized. And to be baptized is to be buried with Christ and raised with him, to put to death the old man of sin, like Christ put to death his own flesh. So Romans verse six, chapter 6, verse 1 to 11, to 11 reads, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't we know that all of us who were baptized in Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. But we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might, might be done away with, and we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we also live with him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer hath mastery over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let do not sin, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. So we must live our lives for God through Christ. And what does living for God through Christ look like in our daily lives? 
Well, living for Christ means to making him the center of your life and seeking to align your thoughts and actions and values with his teachings and example. It involves a transformation of character and a commitment to following his will. We must first surrender our will to Christ. In Matthew 16, verse 24, it reads, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny him themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Living for Christ involves surrendering your own will and desires to follow and desire to follow him. We must also love God and others. We know the first and the second greatest commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind, that that is the, fra- uh, the first great commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor 